Now, on January 9, 2007, Steve Jobs unveiled iPhone by saying, quote, every once in a while, a revolutionary product comes along that changes everything. The CEO of a competitor famously gave iPhone, quote, no chance. During the past decade, iPhone has surprised skeptics, becoming one of the be uh, best-selling and most profitable products in history. It certainly helped drive Apple's rise to be uh, one of the uh, most valuable company in the world. And iPhone and the ensuing smartphone revolution have altered the daily lives of the world's population more thoroughly than previous computer generations. Change everything? Certainly. But in what ways? Positive? Unintended? And with what implications for us today and in the future? We have here tonight seven experts to explore the economic and societal impacts of iPhone and the smartphone revolution. Uh, now we're going to watch uh, firsthand some of the comments that have been shared over the past few months by members of the original iPhone team. Please join me in watching this short video. Steve wanted a phone based on, on the phone we should build, not the phone that we could build. So we weren't allowed to hire people that had made phones before. So when you're making a phone, you're like, oh, well, how am I supposed to build a phone if we don't know how to... Well, you can't Google it. You have to invent it. We weren't supposed to talk about the, the project. Uh, it was complete stealth mode, and Apple being Apple, confidentiality was everything. The way we worked was very collaborative. So uh, a couple of people teamed up with each other. Some other people maybe got an HI designer, a uh, human interface team designer, somebody who had uh, a real sense of, of how things should look and work for humans. It was like working for a startup with infinite resources, and you got top priority on everything. You, know, you needed some new test gear, it arrived the next day. They would give us these things, hundreds of pages of line items yeah. saying, here's all the things your phone has to do. If it's in this category, phone has to do all these things. We started talking with these carriers and we said, you know, we know a little thing about user design, uh, user oriented design. And, um, and so here's the deal. You do the network. We will agree that the lowest level of our phone that talks to your network, you can give us a spec for that. Every single thing above that, you have no say. I think there was this kind of almost naive idea that Apple was going to basically be able to build all the apps that anybody would need. You know, that quickly became um, obvious that that wasn't going to be the case, and that we needed to, to, to turn a lot of the stuff that we, that we had built into a consumable API. As, you know, the product took off, right, and became a runaway success, uh, yeah, we faced the challenges of scaling. Make sure you ask for help for everybody around you, because that's what the Valley's all about. Hope you enjoyed hearing some of the first person voices that have been with us for the past months. Many are here tonight, actually, thank you. Uh, to lay out some of the landscape of the scale and scope of the economic impact that this first panel is gonna be talking about, in the exponential tradition, I'm gonna share with you five numbers. First, 1.2 billion iPhones sold since the 2007 debut. 42 times uh, the, the proportion of the use of data versus voice for monthly uh, mobile internet traffic in 2017. 78 million iPhones sold in the first quarter of 2017. That's a, the equivalent, if you're doing the math, of over 798,000 a day. Think of that global supply chain. 60 plus percentage of Apple's $216 billion revenue contributed by iPhone in 2016. That's compared to iPod's uh, contribution of 40% of the $19 billion uh, Apple revenue in 2006. And last, $1.3 trillion in revenue of the 2016 app economy by more than 3 billion consumers. Now I'd like to introduce our outstanding speakers for this panel. Benedict Evans is a partner at the venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz. He's been working in the media and technology industry for 15 years, attracting many who follow closely his writing on how mobile is eating the world. 
Bertrand Schmidt is CEO and co-founder of App Annie, a leader in app analytics and app market data. He's a technology entrepreneur with over 15 years as an executive in the mobile, internet, and analytics space in the US, Asia, and Europe. And last but not least, our moderator, Stephen Levy, is the editor in chief of Back Channel and author of seven books. Uh, prior to this, he was a senior staff writer of Wired, as well as senior editor in chief, technology correspondent of Newsweek. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to these three. Thank you. Well, thank you, Marguerite, and thanks to the Com Computer History Museum for having us here. Uh, we're in game one of the doubleheader, so we'll get right to it. Let's go back. No what that I have no idea what that means. Oh my God, there's no other Americans on this panel. <laughs> I won't, I won't, it's a baseball thing. Uh, um, so let's go back to 2007, before June, when these things shipped. So mobile phones before then were feature phones, though it was an odd term because they really didn't have the features they have now. Uh, very few people browsed on a mobile phone. I think it was technically possible to do it, but uh, it was so hard you didn't. Uh, SMS was there, but super expensive. Carriers had complete control. The desktop was still dominant computers. Social networks were just beginning to court the mass market. I remember I wrote my first uh, news we cover about Facebook in 2007. And now it's 10 years later, and everything is different because of this device that we're talking about tonight. And it, was the iPhone the most successful product of all time that made all these changes? Well, you mean as opposed to like toothbrushes or fire or something, <laughs> wheel. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's interesting. I, mean, I think the feature phone is, is, is it struck me as you're saying feature phone. We didn't call them feature phones before then. Um, it's a bit like, you know, the first modern battleship was HMS Dreadnought, and all the other battleships before then are now called pre-Dreadnoughts, but they didn't call them pre-Dreadnoughts before then. <laughs> um, and I had a, um, I was looking the other day at a breakdown of handset sales at a big European operator, and they're not smart non -sm in like 2006. And it's not smart non-smart, it's basic voice, um, premium voice, basic text, premium text, basic camera, premium camera, um, and then there's like a little bit for, 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 for what we now call smartphones, which was Symbian and Blackberry and Windows Phone, or Windows Mobile, I forget what it was called then, and that was like a little bit of the market. And it didn't actually feel like we were waiting for the meteorite to come and ignite everything. It felt like there was kind of steady progress every year, and the devices were sort of getting there, and the networks were sort of getting there, and we'd got color screens, and we'd got 3G, and you can run our Java applications, you could run applications on them for you know, close to a decade. And so it didn't feel like this whole new thing was going to happen. It didn't feel like nothing was working yet. Mm -hmm. um, the, maybe the place you were closest to feeling that was actually in America, because in America, Nokia had really low market share, Ericsson had really low market share, the mar US market was dominated by people making really terrible phones with terrible interfaces, um, and the US carriers had kind of particularly prescriptive ideas on what should happen, much more so than European carriers, let alone Japanese carriers. So like, I mean, if you were in Japan, you really wouldn't have been sitting thinking, you know, none of this stuff is working, because they had all these amazing phones. And even in Europe, like, we had Nokias, and they were really nice. They just we had, then you had Nokia feature phones, and they were a bit clunky, it didn't work very well, but it wasn't clear that you needed the meteorite. And then the meteorite came, and then it took like three years for people to work out that the meteorite had landed, and that, 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 that the Earth had actually just shaken, and there was like an enormous cloud of debris kind of over <laughs> us. Um, and so it took a long time for the revolution to be clear and even now, you get people saying, you know, PCs will last forever and smartphones are just for consumption. It's like, come on. <laughs> Which is, you know, I think people probably said the same thing about PCs and mainframes in the 80s. Yes. You, may, you may remember that I was at school, but, you know. Gee, thanks. <laughs> yes, I do remember it. <laughs> but uh, that, that shift wasn't clear. And it's kind of fascinating now how obvious it was. At the time, it was obvious that this was an amazing product to some people. I mean, I, I thought it was an amazing product. It wasn't obvious at the time that what a big change it was. I guess one reason for that delayed reaction might have been when the iPhone first came out, uh, it wasn't an open system. Uh, you know, you, you know, not everyone, you know, as a matter of fact, you know, uh, almost no one could write an application, native application for the iPhone, taking full advantage of it. So Bertrand, you know, tell, tell us a bit about, you know, how the app economy emerged and how big a deal that was. 
Yeah, I guess that's such a big deal that if it didn't happen uh, nine years ago when they, they, they added the App Store, we, we would probably not be talking about the iPhone today. We'll have forgotten about it. Um, I think it was a huge deal. Actually, if people remember, initially, there was a way to develop apps. It was uh, on the web. It was called Web App. And that was supported by Apple. And, but soon, they realized that they had to make a big change. Uh, what happened, it's, uh, if you take the launch of the App Store and 8, it's the iPhone 3, uh, it's 3G. You didn't have 3G on the first iPhone. That was a big bummer to do anything connected in terms of apps. Uh, you didn't have GPS, no way to locate really properly yourself. Um, so, and then the App Store at the same time. So I think it enabled a new class of application, a new class of services that would have been, uh, as we have heard, very difficult to, to build all by themselves by Apple. Um, and, and the enable a new way to, to, for me, what was impressive was a new way to, to discover, to distribute, and to monetize content and services. I have been probably way too long in mobile, more than 20 years. And actually, I remember well this time, 2007, I was so angry about the ecosystem, mm. how uh, carriers were controlling your, your phone, how, as a developer, you couldn't do stuff and distribute it easily. You had to do carrier deal in Europe or in Japan with each carrier in each market if you wanted to distribute any form of content. And if you had proper apps, you would have this cumbersome process that Nokia would let you do or Ericsson. That was very painful in order to... So, so I saw that there was suddenly a shift. You, you can, again, access this content much more easily and not just access it. And that's actually what I believe got the app economy started, is that you could monetize in a way that at the time was actually not so easy on the internet. Mm. Internet monetization equaled uh, advertising, and here suddenly you could monetize with real money immediately, globally. Mm -hmm. That was also another big uh, change. I have, a, um, I have a, a PDF from a, an analytics company, analysis company from 2006 or, or 2007 of the top apps on each platform. So it's the top apps on J2ME, the top apps on Series 60, the top apps on BlackBerry, the top apps on Windows Phone. And first of all, they're all super geeky utility apps. Mm -hmm. So it's like the top app on Windows Phone was a new shell. Mm -hmm. um, and like FTP clients are in the top five apps on all of these platforms. Mm -hmm. um, and they're all really expensive, which is actually like looking at like old, like you look at like old PC apps, and like there's probably people in this room who built them, but like, you know, the, the, uh, the application that you got to let you do charts in Excel was like $300 in like 1985. Um, because like the market was small and there were no tools, so it was hard to build or whatever the reason, but it was kind of the same thing for a piece of mobile apps before the iPhone. They were like $20. I, like, I found a receipt. Yeah. Actually, this is a better story. I found a receipt for buying a, a tube map app for my Series 60 phone. Mm -hmm. And it was like 25 pounds. And um, I had to send them my IMEI Mm -hmm. And they sent it back, back sent me yeah. a code back to unlock the app because otherwise I could just give anybody the app. Um, and that was like, who the hell is going to do that? And so that was why it was all, you know, they were the apps were dominated. You know, there were, the, there were these little app stores and there were apps, mm -hmm. but it was this sort of super niche thing. Um, I mean, I think the, the interesting thing about the sort of the software point is um, there's this sort of analogy that, like, and you can sort of see this happening now with cars, incidentally, that you have a product that's kind of beautifully built, and you start adding digital stuff to it bit by bit. And this happened with cameras, and it's happened in the last five years or so with cars. And each of those bits you add make perfect sense. And then you kind of turn around, and there's like 150 little bits that you've added to it. And the whole thing, like, it's like an iceberg that falls over and rotates under its own weight. Mm. And so it all kind of rotates around, and you need to move to a platform model. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of the moment we'd reached with feature phones, that they had 150, particularly in Japan, incidentally, you have 150 features, and no one, but they've all been bolted onto a, an appliance interface rather than like a software interface. And so the iPhone kind of came at that moment um, that it was the right time to do that and take everything from being like gadgets with too many buttons. That's right. the point. The gadget with one button is brilliant. Then it gets two or three buttons. Then you, suddenly you've got 150 buttons and it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And then it needs to become a computer. And that's what, that was what happened in 2007. We went from gadgets to computers. And that's actually, I think, what's happening with cars now as well. You have exactly the same problem there. Well, well it, it, it's kind of amazing when you, when you think about it, because when 
the iPhone was first announced, and you know, and Steve got on stage and he talked about the, you know, uh, what was in it. There's the camera, and, you know, and you know, could, uh, could play music, of course, and you know, could have these accelerometer, you know, the, the sensors, right? Uh, that they, they, they powered it, um, and it had a soft keyboard, so it made it hard to type. Which so, in, in, so in every aspect of the iPhone, almost seemed to enable a new industry to spring from it that, you know, that, that when people knew that you have these you know, different pieces of hardware in your pocket, they can build a business around it. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a um, sort of each new technology kind of goes through an S-curve. And there's a point at the S-curve when it's sort of flattening out and the kind of the winners are becoming clear. And then the interesting stuff is what are all the things you can build on top of this? Mm -hmm. And so we saw this in the early 2000s when, OK, lots, enough people have got broadband. And web standards have settled down. We've got CSS now. And so suddenly, then you get Google Maps and Facebook and Ajax and Flickr. And then in parallel, you have SEO and SEM. And so you get TripAdvisor and Hotels.com and Yelp and everything comes out of that. And so all this, you get this kind of um, What's the kind of the Cambrian thing of me? You know, get the kind of the flowering, explosion. right? The Cambrian explosion. Cambrian explosion. And so right. that happens on top of PCs, and then it happens on top of the PC internet, and it didn't really happen on top of mobile until like 2007, 8, 9, 10. Um, I mean, there's actually an interesting subpoint to that, which is the PC has had two S curves. So PC had like the 80s, 90s S curve around productivity, and then it had another S curve around um, having um, the desktop internet. And so the PC install base exploded twice, once for, once for the people who wanted Office. And then the people who didn't care about Office then, then got it to get the web. And mobile had the same thing. It had an explosion in the late 90s and early 2000s when we went from like 5 or 10% of the population to everybody having them. Mm -hmm. But they were only doing voice and text. And then we get another explosion right. for smartphones. Uh, Bertrand, you know, you, know, you are the CEO of uh, App Annie, which is probably the premier place that analyzes that, that, that app market. Uh, as the, can you describe the arc of it you know, from 2007 on? Are, are we seeing waves um, uh, w w within that, you know, uh, both with iOS and Android? Yeah, I mean, definitely uh, big waves. Uh, iPhone initially led the charge, I would say now. It's more or less similar waves happening at the same time across both platforms. I mean, what was probably really big, I mean, after the first few apps that was fun and uh, you could do joke and instead of an FTP, mm -hmm. App, it's a, it's a fart app at the top of the chart, uh, thanks well, to there the There was iPhone. a beer app, remember the yeah, beer app? Beer app and, uh, so so I, I think serious stuff happened, and I think what started to happen was probably more started in Asia. Uh, it, it was around uh, Line in Japan, uh, we got WeChat in China, we got WhatsApp uh, at the same time happening in Europe, uh, even if based here. Uh, and, and I think that was one of the biggest uh, dramatic change in what was happening. It's the rise of this communication app. Uh, Apple, obviously, followed suit with uh, iMessage. And obviously, at some point, Facebook saw the importance of mobile, of having a mobile-first uh, approach and potentially splitting different apps. So I think that has been a big underlying layer that we, we should not forget. And it's also connected with other things like better cameras. I mean, mm. all these communication apps, if you don't have a camera, to take pictures, to send them, uh, what are they used for, only for text. So, so we had this massive switch from um, a text-based communication to text, image, video. Mm. So, so I think that has been a big underlying uh, change, communication for me. If it, we... it, all, it also changed the, the, the ecosystem of the way startups work and the way venture capital works, didn't it? Yeah, yes, less so venture. I mean, obviously, venture, there's, there's a new, always a cycle going on at, on a, on, on it at various times. Um, I mean, I think the, there was part of, so there was a more general change, which was like in 2000, there were however many people online. And if you wanted to build a company, so put it another way, if you wanted to build Instagram in like 1995, presuming for the sake of argument that everybody had, had, had a camera, you'd have needed to spend tens and tens of millions of dollars because you'd needed to buy all the Sun servers and all the connectivity, and you needed to write all the software down to the database sort of like by hand. Mm -hmm. um, and so you wouldn't have got out of the door for less than 10, 20, 30 million dollars um, to have your first product. And um, when Facebook bought Instagram, they had less than 10 people. I think they had seven or eight people, mm -hmm. and they'd got tens of millions of users. And so there's always this kind of, this sort of general point about technology that you get successive platforms, and each one abstracts the layer below. And so every generation in tech is standing on the shoulders of giants. It was kind of amazing, though. The iPhone was out that number of years mm -hmm. until 
you know, all of a sudden people discovered, wow, we could build a business just around the camera. Well, it's also, well, there's several things. So, like, the first funny, the first kind of funny apps were all about, loca about the gyroscopes, and you, like, you shake the phone. No one really does anything with the gyros anymore. Maybe that will come back. Um, it took a while to work out that your phone knowing where you were meant that you could build a taxi app. Right. It also took a while to work out that the camera on the back wasn't so first of all, that there's a camera there and that can actually be connected. So it's, and that means something. So it's not you take a photograph, it's saved there, and then you email it to people. It's that mm -hmm. you have a camera all the time. So how does that change? Mm -hmm. I think you could argue with something like Snapchat. There's like a kind of, I would actually say that's like, there was mobile first and then there's sort of mobile native. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, I think you could navigate a Facebook app today using the mouse and keyboard. That like they've taken the desktop app and done this. Right. Um, for a bunch, whole bunch of reasons. I think what Snap is doing is um, saying, OK, there's now a billion high-end phones. There's a billion high-end smartphones. All of those phones have a high-end camera. All of those phones have a camera that can encode video, video in real time. So let's actually think about the camera as being a primary input on a level with the screen, on a level with a keyboard and a mouse. So it's no longer a device that happens to have a camera that can take pictures. Mm -hmm. It's this is a camera, or this is a, piece of, this, this is a piece of glass that is also a camera that is also the interface. Like the glass is the interface and the, and the, and the display mm -hmm. and the camera. So you've actually had kind of several waves as people kind of pick up what is this thing exactly, and what does that mean, and how can you use that? I mean, maybe another example is like all those waves of like hyperlocal app, local apps. So all the apps that would buzz to tell you that your friend was in the room, mm -hmm. and that didn't work for whatever reason. Maybe that will work again. But there's like there's so many things in this, um, so many things that a PC didn't have, mm -hmm. that people pick them up uh, sort of sequentially over time and go, oh, okay, it's got location. Oh, okay, it has an image sense of what does that mean, and they'll be we'll keep having more of those, I think. Um, so we talked about Snapchat. What, what about Facebook? You know, uh, Bertrand, you know, tell, tell me, what, why don't you portray it, because you will look at these things. How dominant is Facebook on mobile? I mean, Facebook, at least outside East Asia, uh, is extremely successful. I mean, and it's not just Facebook. It's uh, Facebook, it's Facebook Messenger, it's Instagram, it's WhatsApp. Um, and I think um, from that perspective, Facebook was pretty smart uh, to make some of these acquisitions understanding that you, you, you want to own all these different uh, pieces. Uh, but as, as Benedict just said, I mean, that's true that if you take the main Facebook app, it's not designed as mobile native. It's a, an adaptation of another product that step by step gets more mobile uh, first, maybe, uh, but not mobile native. So, so there are real questions about how this app, I would say, is uh, evolving over time. And again, that what we have seen is actually a separation into other smaller apps. And, and, and you could ask that goes hand in hand with making sure that I have uh, as many app icons on the user phone. I, I rank on as many ranks as possible on the top charts. I think, I think one of the interesting things here is that like, Mobile, you know, there's, there's an obvious existential threat to Google for mobile because now it's in apps, not just the web. That turned out not to matter that much. I think the bigger existential threat for mobile was actually to Facebook because when you're doing social on the desktop, you go to, you go into more than one website is a pain. Checking more than one website is definitely a pain. You don't really want to get email notifications every time anyone's done something. You've got to add all your friends again. Um, you've got to upload your photographs. It was all, it was much, it was really, really strong when it takes all effect. On mobile, every app has an icon on the home screen and it's often easier to press the home button and go into another app than to kind of navigate inside some big complicated app. Like on desktop, you could kill your competitor by adding their feature, their whole product as a tab, as an icon on your tab bar. On mobile, you couldn't really do that. Um, then there's the address book. And so every app has your address book. So it instantly has all of your friends. And there's a photo library. And there's push notifications. Mm -hmm. And so the smartphone itself was a social platform. And so you get this sort of radical unbundling of Facebook um, that it goes from being inside this silo to being across all of your apps. Um, and so this is why you have Instagram explode and WhatsApp explode. And there were like 50 or 100 more of these things that got to millions of users. Um, and Facebook, um, you know, which is kind of another conversation, but you know, kind of the dynamism of the founder-led company, um, went out and spent over 10% of its company to buy 10% um, of, the, of, the, of the stock in the company to buy first Instagram and then WhatsApp, which were like the two most successful unbundlers. Um, and that sort of got them the commanding heights. Um, and it took quite a while. Then Snap then came in another wave. Mm -hmm. And Facebook has sort of got a, seems like they've got a successful holding action, but it also seems that they will always, you will always have multiple social apps on your phone now because of those factors that, you know, the app, the, the phone itself is a social platform. Well, an another big part of, you know, the, you know, mobile phone infrastructure 
is you know the, the fact there are two operating systems. You know, mm -hmm. uh, there's mm -hmm. iOS and there's Android, which uh, has bigger numbers. There's many more Android devices, yet Apple still reaps the profits of you know. Uh, the, 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 the ecosystem, you know, why is that? And, you know, why, and, and do you think, you know, uh, how do you assess Google's move there? You know, and is, is it one of those things that works just well for both companies? Well, I think we've only got 31 minutes left in this slot. Um, <laughs> so, okay, so there's a couple of moving parts here. The first of them is- um, Can you do it in 140 characters? Or I'll give you two, actually 280. Can you give me 280? <laughs> um, so there's a couple of moving parts. First of all, Apple has a very strong position in the high end. And so if you look, um, and so they have, as it might be, two thirds of the high end of the market. Um, that translates into roughly half of the US, UK, and Japan. Secondly, um, that's just in units. Um, secondly, um, of course, there's a difference between units and install base. Um, and Apple devices tend to last longer than Android, so people resell them or something. So the install, Apple install base is larger, the share of the install base is larger than the share of the unit sales. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, um, people who buy expensive phones care more about what they do with them. Mm -hmm. Um, $600 is expensive to some people, but it's not expensive in, in other contexts. And so um, Apple has, as it might be, half of the install base in the US and the UK, but it has over, so probably over three quarters of the usage. Um, so, so maybe two thirds of the, of the page views and like three quarters of the e-commerce value or something because of that self-selection in the user base. Mm -hmm. you know, the people who are inclined to do more stuff online and who are inclined to spend stuff tend are more likely to buy iPhones. On the other, at the other extreme, you know, um, one and a half, you know, like 500 million of the Android sold last year were probably sold at less than $100. And so they're being sold to people who have less income. They're being sold, they're either being sold to people who have less income and less connectivity and live in poorer places, or they're being sold to people who don't care. So if you genuinely do not care at all about a mobile phone or the mobile internet today, and you go into a phone store, you'll walk out with a cheap Android. Yeah. So there's a whole bunch of kind of self-selection effects around that. Um, now, then the question within that, then, this, then you, get, so you get like, so the second question, which is, is a, a kind of common argument a couple of years ago was, um, this will be the same winner-takes-all effect as it was in PCs. Apple had the high end in PCs, but it didn't matter. They almost died because Windows took all the oxygen. Um, and there's sort of two reasons why that didn't happen, I think. The first is that Apple wrote, did, had much less net not invented here. They rode the general ecosystem much more, so they weren't kind of locked into their own proprietary Motorola chips and their own proprietary stuff, so they could benefit from the scale of the whole ecosystem. Um, the second thing is that ecosystem was just bigger. So in 1995, there were, I've now completely forgotten the number, but there were like, there were like low hundreds of millions of PCs on Earth. Mm. And... So, like, the entire market was, and now there are three billion smartphones. Mm -hmm. So, like, the size of the market was just not big enough to support two ecosystems. Now the three billion smartphones, the ecosystem kind of is big enough to support two ecosystems. And so the result we have is Apple has, like, Apple has maybe 800 million phones in use today, and Google has maybe 2 billion phones in use, and there's like another 500 million Android phones without Google on them in China, which is another conversation. And so there's room for two of them. Um, I mean, to sort of very briefly, the kind of to your point about does this matter for Google, it's kind of an interesting one. It's like Google has to go to Apple to get to the top 800 million users. Um, Apple has to go to Google to get like the best search and the best services. Mm -hmm. So there's a, and neither of them have a fundamental strategic problem with that. Because actually Apple wants to sell devices and they don't really care if you use Google as long as you buy another iPhone. Mm -hmm. And Google wants to get reach. And for Google, Android was a tactic. It wasn't the fundamental strategy. And so they would prefer it if you're on Android, they get more data, but they'll take reach through Android, through Google, through iPhone as well. Um, and maybe to, to double down, there is definitely a big difference by region. Uh, what we see in the US, the demographics for the iPhone. I mean, if we pick Japan, where, for instance, uh, the biggest operator, Docomo, was not available from Apple for a long while, mm. what it resulted is that a lot of high-end phones were Android phones. People got used to that. And a big part of the higher-end demographics willing to spend 600 bucks actually stayed with Android. Mm. And, and even more clear, if you look at uh, Korea, and if you look at China in terms of revenues, actually, I mean, that, that starts to be a very different story, actually. And China is today the biggest in terms of revenues through the App Store. If you include China, Android App Store, the special one, the non-Google uh, one. And it's at this stage bigger than what you can, uh, what is generated on iOS. Well, I, you know, speaking of China, I guess you would say China, you know, is a, is a big winner in this whole movement because, you know, that's where the supply chain lives and, and you know, and 
despite our president's best efforts, it's going to be hard to dislodge that supply chain uh, you know, uh, from China. It depends quite which bit of you look which bit of it you look at. So if you do like the component count or the physical location, then it's say three quarters China. If you look at the value of the end device. Um, even if you don't try and do like weird accounting tricks to kind of work out what percentage of the Apple software is the value in the iPhone, but like the value of the components is actually probably three quarters outside China because it's the sensor from Sony and it's the you know it's all the kind of high end um, sort of specialized components don't so much come from China. What they have is the assembly and all of the kind of the kind of the mid level components. So it kind of varies a little bit how you cut it, um, but yes, you know it's a huge um, you know Shenzhen is the global cluster for consumer electronic, for electronic manufacturing. And so that's where it's gone. Who, who have the losers been in this revolution? You mean other than the, all the other handset makers? <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, I think, you know, what, well, that's slightly unfair. I mean, what Android did was it turned failing subscale handset makers into failing subscale smartphone makers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you were in trouble, Android didn't really help you. Right. Um, and what the, you know, Sam, basically what, the, you know, so that like LG, so, you know, LG or Sony on those businesses have been sort of um, not quite marginal, but they've not been doing as well as they would have liked for a long before the iPhone and then after the iPhone. I think clearly the big kind of swap was Samsung for Nokia, mm -hmm. and you know what happened? Samsung cloned Nokia, and so if you look at Samsung, I mean this is Samsung's business. Obviously, it's built on a, it's built on a um, on a component platform as opposed to being built on a cellular platform, um, but. Samsung is basically every device, every spectrum, every technology, every form factor, every price point, every distribution channel. And at some one point, they were spending $10 billion a year on sales and marketing mm -hmm. for, for Samsung phones, which basically means sales commissions. Um, so they did what Nokia did, which was every possible grid, every possible cell in your matrix of the global handset market, they have a product in that. Um, one of those products competes with the iPhone, and that's where all the profit is, or a large part of the profit mm -hmm. is. And that, you know, they, they do okay in that business. Um, but then there's a whole of the rest of it, and which they basically took away from Nokia and then have ridden the growth that came with that. Um, Nokia had the experience that um, Apple and Microsoft had, which was changing your platform is a near-death experience. Mm. Um, and they had an assumption failing. And I think there's a, there's a common point to kind of Microsoft, Palm, Blackberry, Nokia here, which is that they built their smartphone platforms, or what we now call smartphone platforms, in around about 2000. Hmm at a time when all of your assumptions on memory and bandwidth and CPU power and so on were completely different. And so that got you Palm OS with a black and white screen that couldn't handle real handwriting recognition. And it got you Symbian, which was an enormous nightmare to try and code for because it was all designed around saving memory and saving power and you know, saving bandwidth. Yeah. And so all of those assumptions were baked in at that point. It's like DOS. Yeah. You know, they basically built DOS. They built four versions of DOS. And then there you are eight, nine years later, and it's painfully apparent that a big color to color touch screen is now a viable thing. And that's like trying, that's like Windows 3.1. Mm. They were sitting there, their future off strategy was to use Windows 3.1 to compete against, to mix my metaphors, Mac OS X. That's where they found themselves. They had Windows 3.1 against High Sierra. Mm. And yeah. so they couldn't. And they didn't have the time to do it. And you know, Apple and Microsoft had near-death experiences trying to do that as well. And so they were stuck. Mm. But uh, actually, for me, what's interesting is that at least Microsoft had the option to move faster to a more advanced platform, which mm. they already had for PC, where Nokia, BlackBerry, and others, it was too late. They didn't have a plan B. Microsoft had this plan B all along. If they had accelerated for a bit, that there might have been something different. And, but to go back in terms of winner, I think Chinese smartphone manufacturers, it's another. And we talk about Apple, we talk about uh, Samsung. I mean, if you take the Huawei, Lenovo, uh, Xiaomi of the world, I mean, mm -hmm. these guys have taken a big chunk of the rest. So it's, that's, I mean, that's a, it's a fascinating space. I, mean, I wrote a, a piece a while ago called something like, where is the Dell of Android? Mm -hmm. um, the point of premise being that Dell said, OK, making um, IBM compatible PCs is a really crappy low margin business with no differentiation. Let's love that. I mean, I don't know if Michael Dell would agree with that, but that's like one way of looking at what that was, which is to say to own and accept the fact that you have no differentiation and no margin right. and, live, and love that. And that's what the Chinese guys did. They all said, OK, this is a pure commodity business with almost no differentiation at any kind of hardware or technology level. So what do we do? And um, Huawei has come up with the volume story, so to speak. Um, 
Xiaomi was the first one to say, okay, how can we make Android more appealing? And they came up with a list of four or five things. Um, and then everybody else in China said, oh, that's what you do. Well, we can do that too, which is the problem that Xiaomi ran into, which is, oh, okay, you do a new launcher and you do it like this. And you hire people who aren't colorblind to design the case. Um, and you, know, you get a logo that isn't kind of Shenzhen manufacturing PTY Lucky Dragon Incorporated. You, know, you come up with an actual brand and you mark it and you, like, you make a nice phone. And it turned out that it actually wasn't that hard to do that. And so the whole middle of the market, I'd say Samsung has real problems here because there are something like half a dozen to a dozen Chinese companies. And you, like, you look from year to year and the names keep changing. And there's like a new name that's done this. And there's the one that you did pay attention to that's like, well, where the hell did that one go? Um, but you've got this kind of ferocious frenzy competition there. And as I said, it's like they're all trying to be the next Dell. Right. You know, I'm, I'm wondering, everyone, you know, obviously you talk about the losers in, in, in the, uh, this, this competition, the, you know, this transformation. You ever mentioned Microsoft, and there's that famous Steve Ballmer quote, you know, yep. about... Well, the, uh, the great thing about that quote is he was right. Yep. So what he said is um, they won't sell any of them at $600. And guess what? That was exactly right. And they had... Because they were trying to sell well, it. See how many they sold a thousand dollars. They were trying to sell it unsubsidized yeah. at six hundred dollars. And yes, there were lots of six hundred dollar phones in the market at the high end. I mean, they didn't sell very high volume, but Nokia's premium phone was six hundred dollars, but it was subsidized. And, but, and Apple were trying to have it not subsidized, and they, they had to change the business model completely. Right. Um, now he was completely wrong about the keyboard and everything else, but you know the, the reason he said that he said they won't sell it at six hundred dollars, and he was right. I'm, I'm wondering, you know, just a thought of experiment, what if Microsoft had been galvanized in the same way that Bill Gates had been galvanized about the internet in 1995? Could they have succeeded? Well, did, Bill, did they succeed in the internet? You know, I think they, you know... Well, the I would, I would say, I would, so I would say that what Microsoft's story on the internet is that they failed completely in almost everything they tried, but they were the only computing platform, so you still had to buy a Windows PC to get on to do all the stuff that Microsoft had no role in. Right. So that, that was the. So they thing. didn't and get they, they, they didn't get search. They didn't get they didn't get search. They didn't get servers. They didn't get social. They didn't right. get any of the stuff we do online. Um, but you had to buy a Windows PC to do it because otherwise, what were you going to buy? Buy like Mac OS 8 computer. So your like, so your answer is no because it would have been a, a Windows. So they fa So actually, I would say Microsoft failed the internet, but yeah. because everyone had to buy a PC, that was okay. Um, and then it comes back to what we were saying earlier about like the DOS 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 mobile operating systems, like. It, that was a major challenge, particularly with that timing, for them to. I mean, you, you should ask people from Microsoft about exactly where they were with that. But that was not like an, it wasn't like you could write a strategy memo and you could do it. Mm -hmm. That's like a multi-year thing, and operating systems and changing your platform is hard. So we, we've, we've been talking about how you know the iPhone disrupted carriers, applications. Um, you know, uh, the, you know. Um, we haven't actually talked about carriers. Right. Have we talked about carriers? Uh, well, we, we started with that, but you know, yeah. do you think the carriers well, as a former, have, as a, have been hurt? As a former yeah. mobile analyst and a former yeah, strategist they're, they're, they're at a telephone company. How they yeah. controlled it originally now. Now they don't have the control, the control um, you know, from you know, the apps or within you know, the, very, the respective app stores. Yeah. But the carriers seem to be doing okay because... Yeah, they're, they're, they, very, they're, they're very schizophrenic. And so there's, there's, there's two answers to this. One of them is that the operators look at this and they say, we had all of this stuff in our strategy documents um, in 2000, and now these guys are doing it and not us, and what happened? And I'd probably insert some swear words in there. Um, it's like, those fucking guys, they're doing all that stuff, but we were going to do that stuff. Right. Um, that, to me, is a bit like um, a municipal water company looking at a soda company and saying, we should be doing that, because um, we've got water and trucks. They were just the wrong company to do it. Um, that said, you still needed the network. Mm -hmm. And so there was an interesting split here. You see what happened, and it, there it kind of depended on the market. So what happened in the US was, um, they didn't really have any SMS revenue, but what happened in the US was, um, OK, now you need data. OK, that'll be an extra $20 a month. Mm. <laughs> What happened in Europe, which is a lot of oligopolistic market, so the US is in a very uncompetitive market. The European markets are all super competitive. So what happened was the operator said, OK, you're going to need a bunch of data, um, but we're going to have to roll that into your existing plan. And your ARPU is actually still going to go down by 5% every year. So the European operators make roughly half as much, have, um, charge roughly half as much a month as American operators for roughly the same amount of, of, of connectivity. So it depends a lot where you are. Um, so my final question before we go to audience questions is, uh, how has the iPhone disrupted Apple? 
well, it's not the company that it was anymore, is it? Yeah. Um, there's still a Mac business offering an annex somewhere. <laughs> um, it's, it's, I mean, you'd have to ask Apple people about that, but it's, a, it's gone from being a company that made a much-loved premium PC business, clinging on by its fingernails, more or less, um, to the biggest company in the world. And they have, as it might be, 10 times more people than they ever had before. Um, they must sort of sometimes look around, and it's like, um, I don't know, there's a, um, there's a frame in Tintin in, in America, which the French people in this room might remember, where Tintin is sort of, a cow, he's a cowboy in the American West somewhere, and he kind of, he falls asleep uh, with his head on a tree, and um, he doesn't realize that oil has been discovered next door. And in the next three frames, the whole of Chicago gets built. And he wakes up, and he's lying in the middle of a street, and there's a traffic jam behind him. And there's like skyscrapers everywhere, and a cop says, you can't sleep yeah. there. And I feel like that's sort of what happened to Apple. It's like well, the, you this whole thing happened. They, they, you know, they, they, I mean, they did it themselves. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, this whole thing just kind of exploded. Um, and they must you know, feel like they've sort of ridden a tiger a little bit. I mean, yeah. it's an incredibly professional sort of systematic operation. But you know, like. Yeah, I, I think when, one question, obviously, when you end up making what is probably considered today the most successful device, electronic device ever, and this is not just a de successful device, it's touching potentially nearly, I mean, one billion devices sold, even more to be sold, nearly every man, woman on earth is going to get their smartphones in that pocket in a few years from now. The big question is probably what's next? Mm -hmm. where, where can you find something as successful? Well, um, I think we'll. I think one of these questions will get to that. And, you know, so let's uh, give you another number. I think when the iPhone launched, there were probably 40 or 50 million Macs on Earth, mm -hmm. and there's now a billion iOS devices. Well, you know, the, you know, the, uh, Apple, you know, it, it winds up so much of their business is tied up in in, in the iPhone that you know it, it makes it very difficult then to move off it. They're in a you know, classic innovator's dilemma here uh, because now they've got this business to protect the way Microsoft had Windows to protect. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. I mean, I think most of the other stuff they've done has been about supporting the iPhone. Mm -hmm. um, so the watch and the Apple TV and the AirPod, AirPods, most obviously, are it will basically phone accessories. I mean, you could argue like the problem with the iPhone is it was so disruptive, it disrupted all the stuff that came afterwards. So most obviously, it disrupts the iPad. So the iPad launched after the iPhone. And when the iPad launched, like the kind of the common criticism was, this thing is crap. It can't can't, can't compete with a PC. The truth was, not only could the iPad replace a PC, the phone could replace right, a PC. Yeah, and so the reason iPad sales have kind of done this is because actually people aren't going from their PC to their iPad. They're going from their PC to their phone. Right. Um, and that's the same problem with the Apple TV. The reason why there aren't a billion streaming TV devices that are out there from Apple or Google um, or Roku or Voodoo or all these guys, they're all great products. The Chromecast is a great product. Apple TV is a great product. Everyone's watching it on their phone. <laughs> and so they disrupted all their future products as well as the past products. OK, so more, more, more proof that this phone we're talking about today had a massive impact. OK, here's an interesting question from the audience. Um, could you draw a parallel between the mobile industry and its growth and the autonomous vehicle industry? Yes and no. So what's the line? History doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. Um, so there is unquestionably a collision of the software industry and a non-software industry that thinks it does software, which is certainly what happened to handset makers. They all thought, like Motorola said, of course we do operating systems. We've got 15 operating systems. What are you talking about? Mm. Um, so there's that. There isn't a network effect in applications in the same way. Um, there won't be apps on your car in that sense. Um, it's possible that an endpoint for autonomous cars is that, well, the problem is we don't know how hard autonomy is. We don't know how much data you need. Therefore, we don't know how many people will be able to have enough data. And so it's possible that enough people will be able to get it to work that it looks like ABS. Mm. That a car OEM has a choice of seven people who can sell them a Tupperware box that will make it autonomous. And so it works out like IBS, ABS. And all sorts of other stuff changes, like electric totally transforms the car industry as well. But it doesn't, they don't turn into PC makers in quite the same well, way. Well, I don't know. Bertrand, do you think that uh, autonomous vehicles could be a, a platform that could you know, build its own economy? 
Yeah, I think that there are definitely going to be a platform, but we still go back to your phone is your personal device that you have always on with you, and the same way that you can stream your phone to a TV, to an Apple TV. I mean, you might stream your content inside your car. So I, I, I'm not so sure. I mean, there, there are, I mean, what's interesting with the iPhone, we're in a price point, 500 to $1,000, or even cheaper if you look at outside the iPhone. I mean, a car is still a very, very expensive piece of machinery, a dangerous one on top of it. So I think stuff are going to move more slowly. Uh, and at the same time, I mean, we talk about autonomous cars, our question about electric cars as well uh, in, in that equation. So I think stuff would take more time to have an impact. You cannot take over the world in a few years and you take yeah, you don't have one a, by surprise. You don't have a two-year cycle the way, you did, the way you had in phones. I mean, to kind of phrase my point slightly differently, like Windows Phone was great, but no one bought it because there were no apps. That doesn't apply in cars. If, the car is not, if, the, if that autonomous car is autonomous, then it's not that you can't buy it because it doesn't have any apps. It's, you know, so it doesn't matter. Well, that network well, I think doesn't like, apply like in the, the same way. Like, like the, the phone, ubiquity puts it in a different category. So if you know if the cars are ubiquitous, yes, but my point is platform, each other, then, 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 my point then, is you then don't they get can a, become a platform and new things can Well my point is you don't get a squeeze out effect because the network effects don't apply to anything the consumer sees. The network effects are um, who has enough data to make the vehicle work. And it might be that ten people can have enough data to make the make the vehicle work, at which point you don't have that, I'm not gonna buy that because there's no apps for it point, which is the problem Microsoft had. Right. Ironically, it's exactly what Microsoft did to Apple 20 years earlier, it happened to them. Okay, well, that, that's for a future panel. or, yeah, or That's another hour. Discussion yep. there. If Steve Jobs had not created the iPhone, how, many mobile, how would mobile phones have evolved in the past 10 years? Would, be, would we be anywhere near where we are today? Yes, I think so. Um, I mean, I think there's a, there's a technology takeoff point. So, like, um, imagine you'd been in 2000 and you were trying to predict, like, when the 3G auctions happened, when will we have mobile internet on our phones? Um, so imagine you could have said, okay, it needs to be real computers, not real-time operating systems. It needs to be real applications, not kind of these weird J2ME things. Um, you need, like, multiple megabit per second internet connections. You need some kind of touch screen. That was, like, 2007, 2008. That was when all that stuff became possible. And, like, Nokia had almost iPhones. And, you know, Palm had almost iPhones. And um, Google had an almost BlackBerry. And, you know, so, like, the bits were sort of there. Um, I mean, I mentioned that HMS Dreadnought earlier. Like, it's the first battleship that has steam turbines and all the main armament in the same caliber all on the center line. It's like the right way to do a battleship. But like, if that hadn't happened, then the Germans would have done it the next year, or the Americans would have done it, all the French, or something. So, so in other words, you're saying if Steve same, Jobs didn't do that, we would have, be having a panel now with a bunch of BlackBerry people speaking on the screen first? Uh, no, because <laughs> I don't think BlackBerry would have been the company to do it. But, um, sorry if there are any Canadians in the audience. but. My point is, like, the building blocks were all there, yeah. so it would have happened somehow. Mm -hmm. I will say, yeah, they helped accelerate. A lot of the pieces of the puzzle were there, but they were probably the best at finding all these pieces at the right time. A few years after that, somebody else will have done it, potentially. Uh, I think we still go back to questions. Who had big op I mean, operating systems able to run this new type of hardware? Uh, I mean, Microsoft, Google built one. Uh, you could argue in some ways leveraging Linux, but end up building one. But who could have built that type of next-gen operating system? I mean, it's not clear that yeah. you bring a lot of engineers to, to fly to Finland uh, to enjoy the, the warm weather and, and go build a next-gen operating system at a scale Google was able to I mean, I mean, we might always, I mean, you could run this the, the other way. We know there were plenty of people who said it, who would regret that we spent the 80s and 90s using Windows, but it worked. Mm -hmm. And we might have been in a situation where we were using something that wasn't great, but worked. Mm -hmm. I mean, personally, I was using quite a bit of Nokia, for instance, and as a smartphone, it worked. But yeah, there was a magic source that happened with the, with the iPhone. And I think going back to carriers, I think one of the really smart moves was try to, to remove more the carrier from the equation in yeah. some way. Let's say about what I'm going to build. Let's listen to users. And let's build something that delight users first and foremost, when everybody else had a different mindset, even Nokia. I mean, probably foremost. Nokia. Yeah, I mean, that change in expectation is actually like the fundamental crucial thing. Because this was even more than having the wrong operating systems. It was a sense of what the trade, the, the operating systems were built on those trade-offs. No one realized the trade-offs had changed. So you can't make a phone that will break if you drop it. You can't make a phone that has a battery life of one day. You can't make a phone that uses bandwidth like it's water. And all of those things would have been true in 2000 because the trade-off you got for that wasn't worth having. Apple 
proposed that the trade-off you get for a phone that breaks if you drop and where the battery only lasts a day is worth it. Mm -hmm. And we all said, you know what, you're right. Whereas Nokia looked at the iPhone, first iPhone and they said, but it breaks if you drop it. No, all the iPhone that breaks if you drop it. And they didn't understand that the trade-off now that you got for that was so great that people would be willing to accept that. Okay, here's a great question. Um, uh, it's fun to look back, but what about the future? What do you see over the next 10 years for iPhone and more generally for very smartphones? Um, so um, every now and then I go down to Fort Lauderdale um, where we have a very small investment in a company called Magic Leap. Um, I've heard of that. Yeah, they... Um, they just got some more money, didn't they're they? They're the best known secretive company in the world. Um, so, you know, there's a bunch of people playing around with this. Magic Leap is the So most we're talking about okay. augmented reality. Yeah. Well, yeah, augmented, is it augmented reality? Is, now augmented reality means you wave your phone at something, so maybe we do need a different term. But the point is, like, you put on a pair of glasses, you see something, and it looks as though it's in the world in front of you. Not like a HUD that's hovering here, like Google Glass, but, like, I look at you, and I see your last article, and I see that our head of PR told me that I'm not supposed to talk to you about X, you know, or whatever it is. You know, I look around the room, and I see people, people's Tinder profiles, or their Grindr profiles, or their Salesforce profiles, depending on what time of day it is and where I am. Like, um, I can make this whole table, on my, I can make the whole floor here Minecraft, and I can kind of do this. I can make that whole wall a screen, and if you're wearing the same glasses, you can see that. Um, very clear from the smoke signals that Apple's working on that. Um, Magic Leap is working on that. Um, you put the glasses on, and you go, oh my god, there's a thing right here. Um, it's not product yet. It, that, and that stuff feels a bit like, actually it feels a lot like multi-touch in like 2005, 2006. So in like 2006, someone gave a TED talk demoing a multi-touch demoing a multi-touch screen. And TED audience is all like rich, super techie people. And they're all looking at somebody going, look, here's a screen, and I can do this. And the picture gets bigger, and the whole audience starts screaming. Mm. And then he says, and I can rotate it. And everyone's like, oh my god, look at that. And now you're like, but that's just what phones do. But that wasn't what phones did in 2006. Now, it was, they were then a year away. That was a year before Apple launched the iPhone, and it was like three years away before that became a mass market product. That's sort of where AR, MR, call it what you want to work but want is, is. But I could imagine that being something that, say I have a pair of reading glasses that are tethered to my phone or slave to my phone or something. I could imagine that being a billion user product or a 500 million user product or five billion, which is where smartphones are going, I don't know. But that I could imagine being billions of units. Do you think? What, what do you? What do you think of the? You know, again, Bertrand, I'm sure you're looking at this too, of the the applications we're seeing in the short term with augmented reality, and the yeah. the, you know, the iPhone 8 has a few built in. You know, or, or, oh yeah, I said no one had done anything. Are, with are, are kids, kids apps? Yeah. Are, are, is anyone yeah. you know, getting interested in these apps? These I mean, apps? The, I mean, the, there are apps for sure. It's still early. I mean, you could have two apps uh, really actually had democratize in some way AR. Uh, one is Snapchat, we talk about it. Another one is probably Pokemon. I mean, you can call it AR, fake AR, whatever, but some sort of AR. Uh, so far, there's a, probably the two biggest success. One is gaming, one is social. Uh, it, it's, uh, I, I think going back to, to the point, Benedict, you, you made, I mean, me, there is always this question. When we talk about next big thing, it's how, how much are we talking about? Are we talking about uh, five billion devices? always on in your pocket. Uh, today, world average, two hours a day spent. Some, some markets, we're talking about three hours a day spent. And this just keep going up and to the right, no exception in any market so far. And imagine where it is today. Imagine where it will be in five years from now. Uh, that's the catch up other technologies have to take. Um, so my take at this stage is that AR on smartphone, yes. Uh, the, that makes sense. We have the tech ready. We have everything in, in somewhat in place. Will it catch up? I don't think we have seen enough killer apps at this stage, but I think the next few years will be interesting because the bar to develop AR on smartphones, both on Apple and Google, uh, have de definitely decreased. You have 500 million plus devices that are somewhat AR uh, capable. So that will make things uh, interesting, and that will probably help bridge the gap into making the first glasses uh, somewhat useful, mm -hmm. not like a few years back where it was not that useful, but we will have apps ready in a way uh, to make that useful. Yeah, I mean, Apple does MVPs by doing building blocks one at a time. So, like, they do fingerprint scanner before they do Apple Pay. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I would be rather, think it rather likely that this AR stuff is deliberately seeding the market for what other things they're working on. Um, 
But yeah, you know, in yeah. a sense, sort of to take a step back, like PCs built beat mainframes and minicomputers because they were 10x the scale. And they didn't do it immediately, but because they had 10x the scale, they got all the investment and then they came back 10 years later and killed mainframes. Smartphones are doing that now. Okay. There are, because smartphones has 10x the scale. If smartphones everyone on Earth, you could ask, well, is there anything else that will have more scale than that? Mm -hmm. Or do we go kind of horizontal rather than to another step? Well, let me finish, finish off this great discussion by you know, asking a question, and you'll have to answer very quickly because uh, we've got to make room for the next panel. But um, you know, we've been talking a lot about the enormous changes that you know, this de de device has had you know, on you know, many areas, in, you know, economically and in the business sense. Have all the big changes been made? Um, you know, uh, is the next 10 years, can this device and you know, uh, the devices like it make such big changes? Or will it have to be the next big thing? I think smartphones are on the kind of sec well into the second half of the S-curve. Um, I mean, the cameras are still going to get a lot better. The cameras will, the, you know, the cam I will be able to take a photograph here and it will come out perfectly. So we're not, cameras aren't there yet. And there's a few other things that aren't there yet. But, you know, clearly the difference between iPhone X and iPhone Y will not be as great as the difference between iPhone and iPhone 3. I, you know, so there's a, there's a flattening there. But then there'll be another S curve, whether that's AR or machine learning or something else, I don't know. But there will be another one. Yeah. Yeah, physic physically speaking, I mean, definitely we, we are reaching that maximum screen size versus weight versus dimension uh, with the iPhone 10. And I mean, from there, the question is, yeah, what, what are the additions? I think one thing to keep looking is these accessories. I mean, from your watch to your AirPods, I think we will see way more of it. Again, if we go back to the smartphone as your universal device, let, let's look also at what's coming outside. You take the watch, I mean, we are talking with some around health. Uh, it, there is probably way more that can happen uh, on the healthcare side that is barely touched at this stage. Yeah. It's a lot of horizontal proliferation. Great. Well, I want to thank you both. This has been great. Thank you. Thank you all. When the original iPhone came out, the reviews didn't get it. It was being compared against other smartphones at the time, BlackBerry at all, uh, according to the metrics people thought were important at the time. They didn't get it. What they didn't get was we were changing the entire paradigm. I don't think any of us thought that this was going to change the way people interact. I see people on airplanes when you know, the plane comes in for a landing and they tell you you can turn your phone on. People take their phones out of their pocket and they tell their loved ones that, I, that I'm here, I'll, I'll meet you in a couple of minutes. It's, it's like, that's what I, I, you know, I don't care about the technology quite so much uh, as I care about what it lets people do. I would hope that we as kind of the consumer, the consumer population, uh, figures out a better way to utilize technology in our lives more. Am I going to be hated by them for what we've created? Or are we going to be like, you know, still like, is it yeah. going to be Alexander Graham Bell bringing light to society or did we bring nuclear yeah. weapons to society? I don't know which it is. You may have brought But I, I wake up in cold sweats. I, you know, I worry about that all the time. It's almost funny when you see people falling into fountains and things like that because they're so engrossed into this little screen. But I think that, um, I don't think that's the fault of, of an Apple or, or a Samsung or whoever is making the phone du jour. I think that's just what people do. As Tony Fidel said, are we going to be like Alexam uh, bringing light to the world or like nuclear weapons? That's the question. It's, it's in our hands. Uh, here are a handful of numbers as we introduce our second panel looking at the social impact. 85% of one trillion digital photos each year are taken on smartphones. Probably a lot of your selfies. Four plus hours per day, um, average mobile user use in the United States. 1.6 million people in 20 countries who are employed as Apple suppliers, as we've seen over the past decade, which have raised questions about fair pay and safety for workers in developing countries. 4.8 million workers, uh, think Uber, Instacart, and others, who are part of the on-demand economy enabled by smartphones, which, by the way, is more than the total number of workers 
uh, in the IT and IT services industry today. And last but not least, 2.5 billion smartphone users worldwide by the end of the past year. For this panel, I'm thrilled to introduce our speakers. We have Cindy Cohn, who is the executive director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. The National Law Journal named her one of the most influential lawyers in America for her work, quote, wherever freedom and civil liberties are at stake online. Judy Wiseman is a distinguished professor of sociology at the London School of Economics and a Mellon Foundation fellow here at Stanford University. She's published several books, including most recently, Pressed for Time, The Acceleration of Life in Digital Capitalism. Jean-Louis Gasset is a venture partner at Legis uh, Capital, and prior to this, he was the president of Apple Products for a decade, responsible for all of Apple's global product functions, including product marketing, worldwide manufacturing, and research and development. Our moderator tonight for this panel is John Markoff. He's a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist and author of many books. He joined the Computer History Museum as historian earlier this year. Previously, he's well known as business and technology writer with the New York Times. Please join me in welcoming this panel to the stage. Thanks, John. So the societal impact. Um, when we were planning this panel, um, I argued that we should, uh, actually planning the event, I argued that instead of referring to it as putting a new world in your hands, we should uh, describe, uh, we should label the panel a downward gaze. And everybody uh, thought that was really a bummer, and I was, I was overruled. Um, but nevertheless, the, the iPhone now de defines a, a new, new era of computing in the world, and um, it has reached about half the planet. And tonight we're going to explore how that computing era has changed us as humans and transformed the way we interact with each other. And I want to begin by actually asking Judy, who actually began writing about this before there were smartphones, when there were cell phones. And even at that juncture, you were talking about, um, I guess it's the dissolving the line between it was work and home, but we could call it work and life. Um, has the smartphone accelerated that, and is it a good thing or a bad thing? And it, after Judy, the others as well, but maybe you could start. Is that line gone? Well, is perhaps it's worth sort of remembering, you know, going back to 2007 as the last panel did. I mean, I, when I did my work, it was on the mobile phone that wasn't yet a smartphone. And going back and sort of reading over the, the reports and the research I did, I'm so struck by the fact that there was such a positive reception for the phone. And part of the positive reception was that we were already living in a world where most people in families were in dual earner families, where already um, we, were, we were shifting to a 24-7 economy, where problems of synchronising with other people was, were increasingly difficult. And we then theorised and talked about the phone as being a wonderful micro-coordination um, product that we, you know, that all these problems of synchronising were hard, that to have a family life and a shared community, you need to synchronise time with other people. And so actually what the phone enabled you to do, and it was before the smartphone, was to be able to get in touch with your kids and your family and, and do all of those things that were very difficult so beforehand. You were and super optimistic a decade ago. I was super optimistic. And actually, one of the things I remember that um, when we published this report, you know, I was interviewed by journalists in Australia, and all of them would say to me, um, journalists, immediately, they'd say, oh, you know, I just can't stand the way that everyone on the bus and the train phones in and says I'm on the bus or the train, right? But actually, that was a very important thing. People very much, you know, it's all very well not wanting to hear it when other people are doing it, but everyone was doing it. And we found an incredible spike in phone use just at the end of the school day, that mothers, fathers too, but mothers on the whole, were phoning their kids at the end of the school day, and then they were phoning their partners about what to eat for supper that evening and in the supermarket. So it was increasing so social interaction. Absolutely it was. Yeah. And, and can I just say as a sociologist that we had also, in terms of the thinking about relationships historically over the 20th century, if I can say that, because we think in the long term. I mean, one of the things that we were very aware of is that what um, relationships had become much more about than the earlier phase, if you think about it, of last century, was communication, that people value equal communicative 
rich, self-disclosing kind of relationships. And so communication had become much more important for people. And so the phone really sort of fed into that. It didn't come in without a context. It came into the context where couples would say to me when we're physically apart, having the phone, which we didn't have 10 years ago, makes a huge difference in maintaining the relationship. So Jean-Louis and Cindy, so dial forward a decade. Is that, in your view, is that line continued to erode and is it still positive? Uh, it, it's neither. Uh, I, I think uh, you, can, you can use it and abuse it. And uh, uh, I don't like the, the concept of victimization. Uh, I, I prefer the fact that uh, you, know, you can turn your phone off and uh, you, uh, you know, the sky will not uh, you know, fall on you. And on the positive side, I see families, of course, I, uh, I, I only know what I know, but I see families uh, you know, being uh, you know, happy and cohesive, and especially when you have grandchildren coming in. And, and there's, there is a something that's, uh, that's rather joyful in the ease of uh, communication. I think uh, you know, the previous panel talked about the camera, how the camera has uh, taken over in, uh, in many respects. And Benedict Evans has, uh, uh, you know, you should go and, and look at uh, the pieces uh, he wrote on the importance of the camera for, for the smartphone, that that's become the main thing in many, in many instances. So I think, uh, yes, uh, the, 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 from 10 years on, uh, uh, the, the, world, uh, the world has changed, sometimes for the worse. I think people will abuse uh, uh, smartphones, uh, you know, reach into uh, work groups and, and, and deny, uh, you know, a decent uh, a private life. Cindy, that line between work and life, work and not work, I mean, if it erodes, what does it, to your view, what does it do to the quality of society, a quality of life in society? Well, I think in some ways the phone does free people, right? Because you don't have to be physically uh, someplace in order to participate. And um, I think we as a society, I mean, 10 years sounds like a long time, but it's really not. I think we're still learning how to interact with this device. I think the, the initial rush of the idea that you could be in touch with your loved ones all the time and they could be all the way around the world, you know, as, as connectivity got better, as, as being, you know, on the internet, um, you know, we're not just on the phones now, we're on the internet now. You can really connect with people all over the world. Um, I think we're still trying to figure out how to bring balance back into that because it was something that people wanted for so long. Um, then they got it and now we have to figure out how to do it. I, I do think that, you know, um, there's a, sometimes there's a bit of hysteria, you know, what's the matter with kids today, you know, sometimes I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm worried that, you know, these days people talk about kids and screens like, you know, um, you know the, the old Music Man story about, you know, kids are going to start playing pool, you know, trouble in River City. Um, <laughs> I th but I do think that there is a, there's a tension now and we're trying to find the balance. And I'm not sure those of us who are the first users of a technology actually are the right people to try to figure out the balance. I think it's actually the next generations that are starting to. Okay. We see that in privacy, for instance, which is where I spend a lot of my time. Older people are worse about their settings. They're worse about sharing information. They're worse about privacy when you, when you actually look at the data than younger generation. Because they are. don't care? Why are they worse? I think that they don't understand the technology as well. They don't know how to use the devices as well. But I also think that they haven't associated the idea that the device is actually spying on you all the time in the way that younger people um, have. So you see the Pew studies or some of these other studies will show that the younger people are much more adept at using the privacy settings and they choose to use them more. Um, Did, are they, as a cohort, more private? Can you break it down generationally that way? I think that the, the sense I have, and I'm not a social scientist, I'm, I'm, I'm a lawyer and an advocate, but the sense I get is that um, sometimes we have confused privacy with secrecy, um, and um, I think privacy is more about control and less about what you reveal. So I think we have a generation of, of well, the first generation of users were big oversharers but um, from my perspective, or lots of sharing, right? Um, 
And, um, but that was about, that was still something you wanted to control. You chose to show more about what was going on in your life. I don't think people ever wanted to give up the idea that it was their decision how much to share. That to me is where privacy comes in. Now we see the next generation of kids, um, you know, they're not, you know, the, the use of Facebook, for instance, is down. The use of things like Snapchat that gets rid of things is used is higher. Use of things like Instagram. Um, much less, uh, I think, um, uh, of the kind of idea that you know kids today don't care about privacy. The data does not bear that out, and I think as they're getting used to using these technologies, they're also getting used to gaining a little more control over how the technology uh, is, you know, what the technology is doing, you know, and. The, the, so anyway, that's yeah. that's my sense okay. of it. So when I when I was preparing for this panel, I did a little bit of Googling, and that's always dangerous. But I the figure I got first, and so I stopped there. I didn't look any farther. Was that we touch our phones two thousand six hundred and seventeen times a day, which Oops. sounds like a lot of a lot of touches. But then if you think about texting, you could and a heavy texter could come up with twenty six hundred touches easily, I imagine. But so can can you guys put those numbers in context for me? Um, what is 2,617 a freaky number, or what do you think of that number? I mean, I, I think we have a very sort of conventional notion of sort of how we count these things and what the time is. And as a sociologist, I can tell you that if you add up the figures on the amount of time people are supposed to be still watching television in America, the amount of time they're on the phone, the amount of time they're doing other things, the, the figures don't add up. There are, are still only 24 hours in a day. So what's happening, it seems to me, is a different sort of quality of time, a different experience of time. And it may be that, I mean, I think multitasking is the wrong word, but I think people have got, particularly young people, a real facility now of moving between things at a different kind of pace. And so it may be, I mean, you know, in the old days, we used to talk about the fact that a secondary activity was listening to the radio while ironing, you know, or listening to, tele you know, and that we didn't add those things together, but you could do lots of things, coordinate lots of things, and actually, Really, the, the main multitasking that people always did was looking after kids and doing shopping and doing ironing and doing other things. And it seems to me it's not clear yet what this facility will be and that we m may well get very easy at moving between, you know, that the, the number may sound more frightening than it is. So, but are there yeah. costs to multitasking? Are there emotional costs or, or cognitive costs or societal costs? I mean, if we're all distracted between 20... Well, I don't know that it is distracted. That's what I mean. I mean, I just wonder if, um, like, a, a phone call on a conventional phone or, you know, whether... whether whether over time, I mean, in the, you know, when you first got a landline, presumably you jumped whenever the phone rang, then you, you get a very different attitude to it, you get an answering machine, you have a different modulation in terms of your attitude to it. I remember when we first got email, we absolutely answered, you know, we were so excited, it was a, you know, I think over time people integrate a lot of new practices into their kind of daily lives and it mightn't be as disruptive as it feels right now. Any other thoughts about touching your phone constantly? <laughs> well, I think it's true. I mean, uh, in the in the you know a recent Supreme Court ruling, Justice Roberts said that you know that if aliens came down from space, they'd think it was actually yeah. an extension of our bodies, <laughs> of our hands, and um, and you know he's not a particularly technical guy, but uh, he, he he's probably right about that. I do think that. Um, you know, people, you know, the, the phone, you know, they took my phone when I got here and it's somewhere and I'm actually a little nervous because I don't know where it is. And I think that's a widely shared thing. I do think that we are all sorting out how to live with these technologies though. And one of the things that the iPhone did was, I think your, your point exactly, it gave you lots of different things you could do with this little device. And so people do go from one thing to another. I, I think we're all learning that, um, you know, slowly that um, nobody really multitasks very well. You just phase shift and um, that can be dangerous if you're driving a car um, and other things. But um, we all now have a, a technology that um, pulls on our attention all the time. And of course, a lot of the, uh, the, uh, Apple is a bit of an exception in this, but the business model is trying to pull your attention mm. as much as possible for all of the apps in the App Store and all the other things that we do. And this is another kind of skill that I think people are gonna, gonna start to learn, which is how not to have their attention so pulled. 
um, by these devices, but right now all of the venture capital money and all of the business models are aiming in a not, they're not on your side if you want to control your attention. They're, they're, they're trying to, to, yeah. to, mm -hmm. to manipulate that, mm -hmm. and, and we don't do it very well yet. The, the ad blocking movement is a, is, a, is a good proof of what you just said. A lot of users are, are fed up with the way their attention is abused, and they are defending themselves with technology uh, on a browser, on, on, a, on an operating system in, in the smartphone, uh, especially uh, you know, from, from Apple that doesn't need uh, advertising revenue. Uh, so th this will get much, much better in, in terms of defending ourselves against uh, uh, the, the annoying uh, you know, interruption. I mean, we all know that we hate these, uh, these ads. There's no question about that. And it's creating a lot of uh, uh, concern in the so-called ad tech uh, you know, sector, which is one of the most fraudulent uh, things that we've seen. And, uh, and successful. Yeah, uh, yes. Well, fraud, uh, fraud uh, is an old uh, human uh, pursuit. Great tradition. It's yeah. interesting. I, before we, we started, I sent around a, a fairly critical list of articles to the panel. The panel seems to be more um, optimistic, I guess I should say, than I expected. I may have to be the, the, the critic here. <laughs> let, let me ask about the societal consequences of being always connected. Um, what, that's new here, right? I mean, 24 by 7, always on. Um, there are ancillary issues that we'll get to, like cutting into sleep. But, but what about us being woven together in this invisible web um, that, that, you know? I mean, I, I, you know, as you know, John, I think all technologies have got um, contradictory effects. That's how they, unintended consequences, contradictory effects. So, you know, whereas my sort of intuitive thing would be to say, isn't it a terrible thing that kids are always on their phone? When I speak to people who study these things, they say to me, well, was it better to sit in the back of the car and be bored for three hours while your parents drove along? That, f that you know, there are very positive things as well as being able to communicate, I mean, even, even with sort of young people, to be able to sort of communicate with their friends when they're at home and maybe feel isolated, to get support. There's lots of positive things as well of, and I agree with you, uh, that a lot of the social media are absolutely designed to be as addictive as possible, to keep you on there as long as possible. There's a lot of social pressure from other kids that come through this social media, and a lot of um, bullying in schools over this media. So, I mean, there's a lot of new negative things, but I think a lot of positive things as well. So I wouldn't like to say one or the other, and I'm, I sort of am concerned that we're still in this debate where, where, well, now it's sort of shifted in my, you know, when I was doing the research, it was very positive. Now suddenly there are endless scare stories about how terrible this is. Which you're skeptical and, about. Well, it reminds me of the um, discussions about television that I remember so, so well and being interviewed as a kid in Australia in the 50s about the fact that, you know, did I ever go outside anymore since we'd got a television? I remember this very well, these debates. <laughs> and I said, yes, actually, I still do, you know. Yeah. Well, let me ask this question in a different way, and, and, and perhaps uh, to Jean-Louis. So there's this science fiction notion of an alien race called the Borg. And you know, now as a result of, of these phones, you know, we're in this soup of algorithms that offer us all kinds of advice, and they're not transparent, but they, you know, we're given life advice uh, constantly. Are, are we being assimilated? Um, is resistance futile? <laughs> <laughs> no, resistance, first, resistance is not absolutely futile or futile or whatever uh, you, you, might, uh, you, you might want to say. Resistance is easy. Is, it is really easy. Technology provides you with the tool to resist. For example, you can not use Facebook, and I can guarantee you, you will not die. <laughs> you will not die. And, and you will be able to mate. Uh, even <laughs> if, if, you don't, uh, if you don't use Facebook, or, or for, for that matter, LinkedIn. You know, th those are things are, are great if you know and like to use them, but you, you can turn them off. You know, that's, that's the freedom we have. And then, then when I, uh, I'm, I'm an avid reader, and when I think of all the libraries that are available to me 
on, on, on the phone or my computer, but you know, you, the, the internet and the search engines and, and uh, the things like uh, you know, uh, Wikipedia, and then from, and hyperlinks. You know, the great invention is hyperlinks. You can, you can uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the old joke is that Jew, Jews uh, invented hyperlinks. You know, with the Talmud and all the references about references about <laughs> references. So now you have, now you have something. <laughs> no, seriously. seriously. <laughs> now you have this infinite uni universe of knowledge. You can, yeah. you can jump around. So we can look at the bad things, which are true, but we can look at the, the enrichment because I believe as a human that my job is to know as much as possible about the world and to have reverence for the world. And the, these, uh, these new technologies uh, give me more power to do my job as a human being. So Cindy, do you think there's a, I mean, do we lose our independence in this bargain? I mean, uh, you know, we get everything uh, in terms of advice from which Korean barbecue to buy to who to marry. Um, and we know nothing about the motives of the applications that are giving us that advice. Yeah, I, I think that there's a lot of work to be done to bring some transparency to um, a lot of the, to this this um, this world. I worry a lot, especially as people are embracing ideas about trying to apply machine learning techniques to all sorts of things where um, it's actually you know um, the 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 data that is being you know uh, garbage in garbage out right the data that's being fed into these systems and then they start to look for patterns those patterns reintroduce our biases in some places they make them even worse and I think that this idea that the machine isn't going to re uh, isn't going to is going to make things fair because if a machine did it is not true it's never been true and we need to make sure that we're really careful about where we apply these kinds of things. Um, I think Jean-Louis is right about people remembering that they can turn things off. I think that that's good. I do, though, think that we also need to stand up and make sure that these technologies serve us and not the other way around. That's, that's what I do. Um, I worry about this constant connection thing, um, not just in the kind of consumer side, but you know, where I spend a lot of my time is dealing with your interactions with your government. Um, and the governments of the world. And these systems are surveillance systems. They have been built, um, if they weren't originally built to facilitate surveillance, they are now massively uh, compromised so that they are surveillance systems. And I worry about the, um, the consequences of that for democracy and for basic liberty. So I do think that while it's possible to turn them off, there was that hilarious um, onion story about the guy living on the Google-less island where you know he couldn't talk to anybody and nothing would support them. And so you, you can look it up on DuckDuckGo or whatever your favorite search engine is. <laughs> um, but I, I do I, I do worry that that it is hard for some people to disconnect and do this. I think it's easy to say when you're a certain time in your life and it's a little harder to say at a younger time. I also worry that the, um, we're building uh, closed systems, systems that's very hard to leave. Um, and Apple's App Store, while it is open to build an app, you still have to get you know, Father Apple's approval in order to offer it to people. That is not a closed, that is not an open system. That's a system with a benevolent dictator, um, sometimes not so benevolent. Um, and we have lots of examples of that. So I also do worry that the natural thing that might happen, which is uh, people will get tired of systems that don't serve them and start looking for other alternatives that do, we're, we're shrinking those opportunities when we're building these closed systems and systems that are hard to leave. And, and Apple is one of them, Facebook is another, um, Google, Amazon, um, I think they call them what they call it, Faga. In, the Frightful in, Five recently. In, uh, in, uh, in, um, in, in Europe, they have a name for the, yeah. the big ones. And so I think that while it's right that we can now turn these things off, I think we do have to watch these societal, other societal issues to make sure that those opportunities remain for us because they aren't, it didn't come down, you know, it's, it's not written in stone that technology will always serve us. We have to stand up and make that the reality. Yeah. Jean-Louis, I wanted to ask you a question about pace. So uh, the iPhone is an architect for a smart phone technology that's gone from zero to half the world's population in a decade. 
um, that rate of diffusion, is, is that a one-time event or is, um, are we in seeing some kind of acceleration and what are the consequences of that kind of a change if it's acceleration? Well, I've, I've been a techie uh, all my life, uh, so I, I built my first radio at age uh, eight and I'm now 73, so you can, you know, I've seen, I've seen the arc of, uh, of technology, especially when the microprocessor uh, got invented. There was a huge acceleration, uh, you know, then, and then the personal computer came out, and then, then the really personal computer, the, the smartphone, uh, you know, came out. So there have been a number of, uh, of acceleration, and uh, I, I uh, you know, I've been very bad at, uh, at predicting uh, at predicting things, uh, so I, I... As all we are. Yeah, 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 yeah. no, but I'm, I'm, I'm painfully aware, of, uh, you know, of, uh, I keep in mind those bad predictions uh, right, right here to, to, to uh, try and keep me uh, sane. So, um, I, I, uh, I think there will be a, an iteration of personal computers because in my view, all these things are personal computers. You know, you look at the Apple product line, they are small, medium, and large. You know, the, from, the, from the, 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 that watch, which is now a personal computer with a, with a phone connection. And I think we will see iteration of personal computer that become even more personal, because that is more personal than, than the one in, uh, in, uh, in my pocket. And, and things that people call wearables, uh, I don't like that uh, that term, but mm. for the, for the lack of uh, better things, which will which will create all sorts of privacy yep. and independence and surveillance. Uh, Your use of the word personal suggests control. I mean, personal suggests or intimate suggests from the bottom up as opposed from the top. Yeah, down. well, so that, that was uh, you know remember the the 1984 commercial when when uh, the Macintosh was introduced. And, and clearly, the Macintosh was seen as anti-Big Brother, IBM, but anti-Big Brother. So now we are in fear of Big Brother uh, again, and for, for very good reason. Europe has better regulations about, uh, about uh, you know, the, the, the dissemination, acquisition, and storage, and sharing of, uh, of uh, personal data. Here in the US, it's... Uh, it's an abomination before the Lord. Um. <laughs> well, I, I wish Europe was better about the government. Um, they're great on the, they're, they're, they're much better on consumer data. They're, they're, yeah. they're not so good about the About, about personal data. About yeah. the government having yeah. access yeah. to that data. Yeah. So I think, I think wearable might be an opportunity to, to see yet another explosion for things like uh, health and fitness. I, I think uh, you look at a problem such as uh, diabetes uh, type 2, which costs uh, like 800 on so many billions of dollars per year in the US uh, only. And it is mostly, not entirely, but mostly due to the fact that uh, we have abundant, inexpensive uh, food. And, uh, you know, uh, we come from the back ages where, where food was not abundant, so our instincts. Uh, have not adapted to, to the abundance of food, so wearables might be, uh, might be an opportunity to, to surveil our blood glucose, for example, yeah. heart problems, and so that, that's, that's a, okay. I think it's a big deal. Judy, let's talk a little bit more about acceleration. You've studied the social perception of time. Has, has I did want to say something oh, about this, ahead, though. Am I allowed to do that? Yes, you yes, are. Yes, go ahead. yes. Well, just a, just a sort of few things. I mean, one thing is like, you know, I can see what you're trying to get at in terms of um, independence, but I think it's very important not to lay too much on the phone. So in terms of young people, for example, I would put much more focus on the heightened risk in America, which I find sort of very irrational. The kids are much, uh, are, are not, that, that parents don't give kids the freedom, that, ha that people are living in suburbs that are very isolated, that there's all kinds of sort of surveillance and anxiety. I mean, I'm very struck coming from Europe where actually there's public transport, kids are on transport day and night, they're in public spaces. So what happened to us in America? Why what? did that happen? Well, it's partly to do with the design of cities that's now exacerbated by inequality so that people are living in, in cities where, um, and in suburbs where they don't mix a lot with people of different classes and races. It's a whole series of things that built up over a long period of time. And I just think one should focus 
more on those sort of structural issues that, than the phone as being what's isolating people. Because you could make the obverse argument that actually, at least on online communities, people can engage with people who are different. I mean, whether they do or not is a no, that's, issue. That's a, a de so you're, gonna, you're arguing that a virtual community is sort of, for all practical purposes, equivalent to a face-to-face? -face no, community? I would never argue, absolutely not. I would okay. never argue that. I just mean that given the way um, children are actually kind of surveilled by their parents and, 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 and not playing outside in cities, in streets, in, all, you know, in, in public places, that you know, we, one could equally make the argument that they have access to all sorts of other communities and people that they mightn't have if they were sort of living in the, yeah. in the current arrangement. But I also wanted to sort of yeah. come back you know, to this point, which is that I do worry about, as you, as you say, in terms of um, you know, machines making decisions for people, that one will focus on all of these self-tracking devices as, 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 more, as, as people being sort of positioned to take on more and more personal responsibility for their own situation, for their own health, for their smoking, for all of these sort of things, that if you can monitor these things, then why on earth can't you uh, display self-control? And we all know that it's, mu it's much harder for some people to live in healthy ways than other people, you, and the self-tracking won't help that. It's called the quanti quantified self-movement. Sorry, here. yes. And could you bring in the privacy aspect of that? Because she's looking at it from the personal point of view, but what are the, I mean, little brother is watching you, right? I mean, not, maybe not big brother, but are there, are there, are there? I think they're both watching you, actually. Yeah. Um, got lots of brothers out there, big ones and little ones. Um, I, I do worry that, you know, look, we, we don't have to build a world in which having all of this functionality means we're all constantly surveilled. We, we've decided to do this, and, you know, I've spent a good chunk of my life trying to make sure people use the one technology that helps them regain control of these things, which is cryptography. Um, and yet, here we are again, Stephen wrote a book on it, um, and I did a lawsuit about it in the 90s, and here we are again having the same conversation. There is one technology that gives us privacy back, control back, and frankly, security back, which is important in this world right now. Um, and we're still struggling to get it baked into the technologies and the tools that we use. And I think that's a, that's a place where we ought to really focus our attention because otherwise, all of these awesome things that we get to do have a pretty high cost. And I, it's not just a cost, I mean, it, it's not just a cost because Big Brother might come and take you away. Um, it's a cost in terms of our basic senses of, sense of self, that, that we're not in control of our information. So that has security problems as anybody um, most of you are probably in the Equifax uh, database. You didn't choose to be, but you're there, and now that data is, is everywhere. So if you're worried about you know, that kind of security, if you're worried about maybe there are people in charge of our government who are taking steps against people they don't like that are um, frightening to the rest of us, um, those are, those, uh, you get all of those back if you actually implement technologies in a way that protects security, protect privacy, and use encryption. But we're not doing that, and wearables is the next thing. You know, there are people who, there are technologists who I've advised who have looked at pacemakers, who have looked at, you know, the, the, the technologies that give um, insulin to people and other sorts of, you know, we already have a lot of wearables in our world. We call them medical devices. They're not secure and there, many of them are now starting to talk to the internet, which is such a bad idea. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and so, you know, I, I'm very excited about the idea of what technology can do to empower us, but I don't think the, I, 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 I think that if we aren't serious about making sure that we bake in security and privacy, these things that could be awesome are gonna end up being awful. I didn't want to leave Judy's notion of risk and the different perception of it. When we were driving over here this evening, we crossed the railroad tracks at Caltrain, and I pointed out to her the crossing guard that's there that goes all through our community now, and it's, it's there. And So you may disagree with me, but I wanted to propose this. There, it's there because there was a wave of teenage suicides, and this is the way the community's dealing with this. And one of the theories, and you know, come back at me if you think this is not right, is that sleep deprivation amongst teenagers has led to depression, which has led to suicides. Now, um, I will disagree. With okay, you. and why is, why is that wrong? <laughs> because I think in this context, um, the pressure on kids to perform 
worries about the future of work. I think we're, I think the, I mean, I'm very struck, particularly when I go around American universities, that it's like a, a you know, a, a pressure cooker um, atmosphere and that somehow, um, you know, I was at Cornell actually, and you know, talking about phones and things. And I mean, you know, literally, the, they were sort of undergraduates, and they were just saying to me, "But we're so worried if we're not working all the time and watching TED talks, and every moment of every day has to be spent productively because the other kids are doing it." And you know, and this is the case in schools as well. It's so it's just enormous, unique I, about America. I think it's particularly strong um, in elite places like here, and I would, I would just at least want to put that in the context, um, you know, in terms of, I'm not denying, so I'm not denying, silly. I'm not, I'm not sort of denying that, you know, there might be, by, might be slip, sleep deprivation, but I think the sort of, the pressure now on young people facing a labour market where we know it's harder and harder to get jobs, um, there's a lot of insecurity, the parents project that onto the children, I think that's the, the broader context. Okay. John, John Louis, do you have a, a view as a Palo Alto? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, first, I have a view that in the richest part of the world, which is Palo Alto, uh, uh, we still have level crossings. So, you know, and diesel, and diesel locomotives. <laughs> you know, right. which, uh, it's a third world country. You, you know, uh, so, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, really, it's really bizarre. Yeah. Now, there, there is a very interesting uh, website that you might want to look at, which I highly recommend, it's called R worldindata.org, rworldindata.org. Uh, it's, uh, it's run by a, an Austrian uh, scholar now in residence uh, in Oxford, England. And they, they have an amazing tr thesaurus treasure, whatever, of statistics, including on suicide, mm -hmm. okay, which is, which is a really a, a concern. Uh, now, Suicides are mostly connected to economic downturns. Downturn, upturn in suicide, uh, number one. And two, it is connected to firearms at home. <laughs> yeah. Okay? Yeah, yeah. This is the most connection. Uh, the CDC says about 50%. Uh, the, uh, the uh, Our World in Data website says 44%. Uh, yeah, and in Hawaii, there's almost, in the state of Hawaii, there's almost no uh, uh, firearms at home, very few suicides. And then, and then you can climb, uh, you know, California is still in the middling, you know, the part, and then you go up and up, and uh, I won't name the, uh, the, the state. So, so that, that's a, 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 a real, real, uh, you know, concern because uh, our culture seems to willfully ignore that uh, that uh, that fact. Yeah. So I, I I still want to come back to this this the the situation of of um, the question is have phones actually isolated us? We were supposed to have these wonderful virtual communities. Now I'm relying on this recent article in the Atlantic, which I think you're very skeptical about. But one of the the numbers that just jumped out at me is that uh, she said the number of teens who get together with their friends nearly every day has dropped by more than 40% 40 40 between 2000 and 2015. The decline has been especially steep recently. She, so one, is, is that true? Are people spending more time apart from each other because they have these new uh, digital companions? I mean, I, you know, I can't sort of engage with that study in particular, but more generally we know that actually the more sociable kids, the more they use the phone. There isn't a correlation. You know, that, that correlation is, 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 is not wrong. the one I would expect, right? Kids who are active in real life and with kids connect a lot on Facebook and in all of these things. I mean, I, kids who are isolated, there's a problem with isolated kids and what they do and, and how they may use the internet, but I, you can't make that sort of generalization. Okay, okay. Um, we're, we're getting to this point, but I, I, I haven't gotten to any of the privacy questions I wanted to ask, but I do... <laughs> I keep sliding it in. Yeah, I know yeah, you do. Yeah. It's, but, but I want to ask, how has the phone changed law enforcement? I mean, we see it everywhere, but I mean, do you have a, a, a systematic thought about about the changing balance of... Uh, I, hugely. I think that the phone has been a piece of a really what a um, uh, law professor named Peter Swire calls the golden age of, 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 of law enforcement surveillance, right? It's, it's made 
you know, the phone, the phone added to what the PC was already doing, which is the phone added place. So now the cops not only know who you are and what you're saying and who you're talking to, they know where you are when you do that, which is incredibly important for, um, you know, for for creating the 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 situation in which law enforcement, rather than using the traditional tools of trying to go out and investigate crimes, will just go to your provider and ask where you've been. Um, there's a case currently up in the U.S. Supreme Court that I think people should keep an eye on called Carpenter, um, which is the you know which raises this question about when do the cops have to get a warrant before they get information about where you are uh, over the long term from your your provider. Um, not Apple in this case, usually it's your phone provider because the, the phone will, will ping the cell towers. Even if you're not using it, um, it'll ping the cell towers to, to make sure that when your, you know, your phone <laughs> rings, right, that, that when somebody calls you, it finds you. So that's not a bug of the phone is to feature, but we haven't built up the kinds of privacy expectations around that that I think people really need to. Carpenter is going to be a chance for the Supreme Court to look at this warrant question. Um, but in general, I, I do think that um, it's it shifted things a lot. Another area where we deal, this comes up a lot for us, is in the context of border searches. Um, it, the law used to be that when you cross the border, the you know you're, you did you had a diminished. Um, privacy right because the border guards have a job to make sure you're not bringing contraband in so they get to open your you know your your suitcase and make sure you're not bringing in contraband well now you don't just carry a suitcase over the border you carry your entire life you carry everybody who you talk to you carry um, access to your other services um, most of them it's hard coded in so if you've got your phone you can you know you can go and look at your Facebook and things like that as well um, so um, this is an area where the smartphones and the have really you know revolutionized things um, in in kind of a backwards way which was a thing that seemed pretty innocuous and not very majorly intrusive into your life suddenly becomes very intrusive to your life if you're crossing a border and the cops demand your device and the password. Um, so we've launched a, a lawsuit in, um, in, in, the, in Boston uh, to try to get the Fourth Amendment um, extended to these border searches of your devices um, because the thing that you carry over the border now just isn't your suitcase anymore. It's far, far more. And we think it's time for the courts to recognize that and make sure that, you know, your your privacy protections are commensurate with with you know the the life you live today. How much of a balancing factor is the camera on the smartphone and the fact that in almost every uh, interaction between people and law enforcement now there's a camera somewhere yeah. and it's played a role in political movements like Black Lives Matter and mm -hmm. elsewhere. It's tremendously important. I think it's made a really big difference. There's been a lot of focus that people have made on making the cops have cameras, um, but we are now learning that that's a really not a good solution because the cops turn it off, it suddenly goes missing, things get lost. But the rest of us having cameras has been very important in terms of capturing the, the excesses of law enforcement. And, and we're in this funny moment right now where you know uh, people of color in this country are um, uh, what they have been saying for a long time, the people who, people, you know, white people are starting to see the reality that people of color live in this country. And um, I think that can be one of the great things that might come out of this. We need to, you know, there are now people trying to pass laws that say it's illegal to do that. We continue to have to fight. We just won a case in the Third Circuit over the summer about your right to record the police and whether that's okay or not. So that's not inevitable. We're going to have to fight that. But I think it's one of the great positive spins um, on our relationship to law enforcement that's come out of the smartphone revolution. Yeah. So uh, several of these questions have been asked by many people, and um, <laughs> this, this, one, uh, this is one of them. It kind of surprises me, but I'm going to ask it, uh, put you all on the spot. Um, on the subject of privacy, what do each of you personally do to protect your privacy on your mobile devices? It's a personal <laughs> question. Let, let me start with... Um, I use Signal. Okay. It's end-to-end -end encryption SMS uh, application. It also makes phone calls. And, and if your communications, you use it exclusively? 
No, because Apple actually, one of the good things that Apple did is if you're communicating with another Apple user, iMessage is end-to-end -end encrypted. Yeah. And that's, you know, Apple has done, you know, I'm, I'm critical of Apple in, in, in many areas, especially around this idea of the closed platform and some other things. But when it comes to, um, uh, comes to protecting privacy and build devices that actually give you um, privacy back, the end-to-end -end encryption in the iMessage, you know, kind of overnight gave people so much more protection in their communications. And, and I think they deserve to be lauded for that. Um, that's a, a, as big a step as their standing up to the FBI last year and refusing to dumb down their technology and make us all less secure in order to, to, to uh, give law enforcement a tiny little edge in a case that they'd already solved. But, um, but I, I think that, um, that, that, that I use iMessage when I'm talking to other iPhone users. I would love a world in which I don't have to know what kind of phone you have in order to get end-to-end -end encryption. Signal is one of the, the technologies that, that make that possible and easy. They're not, it's not the only one, but you, you asked me what I yeah. use. So yeah. We don't endorse <laughs> products at EFF, but, but that is one that I use. John louis do you do anything special to protect your privacy? Well, uh, I, I use uh, uh, iMessage, uh, and also I think we should, uh, you know, to follow up on something you said, we should, we should tell the imbeciles in Congress <laughs> that uh, it is impossible to uh, outlaw mathematics. Yes. Because, be no, seriously, because cryptography... <laughs> Look, I say they don't listen, but they should listen to him. <laughs> <laughs> cryptography, cryptography depends on deep and unassailable, unmovable properties of numbers. Okay, so it's mathematics, and and if you create privacy uh, that is for the good guys, meaning the government has a little little key to get into, the bad guys can easily. I mean, if if. Two engineers, you know, in a basement can create a new uh, messaging system with end-to-end -end cryptography that is impenetrable to any and all government agencies. So we have to tell the imbeciles that mathematics cannot be outlawed. <laughs> <laughs> Judy, do you do anything special? Oh, I think this is a very unfair question <laughs> to ask a sociologist. All I would say is that friends of mine say I have a very light digital footprint in that actually I use, um, I actually use the phone very little. I'm not on Facebook. Um, yeah. Okay. You don't worry about it. It doesn't. Yeah. No. Not good. And, and I'm, I'm one of the people who has had his email read, um, at least by hackers. I don't know about governments, but. Uh -huh. um, oh, John. <laughs> I have no evidence. <laughs> first of all, first of all, you all have, right? I mean, this, 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 just to, right. to be oh, clear, the way, the way mass this. surveillance works is that you all have your communication subject to government surveillance. You just have to hope that the searches that they do on the back end through the big stream that they get access to don't include your identifiers. And that is a secret. So. I don't know. Yeah. I didn't come here to make you all not sleep well tonight. But, <laughs> um, but that is how mass surveillance, the mass surveillance works right now. Um, that's part of why our focus is making sure as much of that stuff is encrypted. Because if you're using iMessage and it's going from here to there, it's traveling across those wires that are tapped into. But it's still encrypted so that they have a, a much higher barrier to try to get access to the communications than they would. Um, they still know who you're talking to but they may not know what you're saying. This is another question that many people asked. Um, if we're struggling to stay off smartphones, how are we going to deal with augmented reality glasses with screens in front of us 24 by 7? <laughs> this is more of the... the it never gets easier. You're always going to... You know, I, again, I, I, like you, I had a grandmother who you know, called it the boob tube and thought it was going to be the, the end of the world that, you know, that kids had access to television. Um, technology is always going to present I think, um, opportunities and challenges in equal measure. Uh, I do worry about, uh, uh, you know, we, the virtual reality kind of um, early stages of virtual, virtual reality. We're going to have problems. I think we're also going to have problems with early stage of autonomous cars. Um, but ultimately, I think that 
you know, societies do figure out how to handle most of these technologies. I mean, um, I, I mean, you know, I do think, you know, I, I don't want to come over as completely Pollyanna-ish. I mean, you know, I do think there is a problem with the way in which technologies are designed to be addictive, that the best behavioral psychologists are actually being employed by these companies. I mean, it's like with gam internet gambling. I mean, there's a big problem with that because they're actually designed to, to keep people on. And I think a lot of effort is, is going into doing precisely that. And I think it would be good to have a bit of a discussion with these companies. And, you know, the Nest chap um, that we were talking... Tony. Tony. You know, we were having exactly that discussion in that he's one of the people who now says, oh, we never realised what we created and I now don't let my children use any technologies at the weekend. And I thought, well, that's all very well for you. You say you created, worked at Apple and now is doing that. Well, if that's the case that these people... He, he talked about the fact we've now grown up, we've got children, we now think about these things differently. Well, if that's the case, then perhaps that generation could think about a bit of a, a rejigging of the design so that, you know, one could still have the good things with these technologies, but not have such a focus on kind of compelling us to compulsively yep. sort of be on these well, technologies. And I think transparency can help here. I think that right now there is um, a, a, a growing and needs to get louder movement to try to get a clear picture about what are the how, how, what are the what are the what are the tricks that are trying to help keep us um, focused on so they probably won't these companies probably won't become more transparent voluntarily what might uh, give us an example of you know how you might implement transparency how could you make these these uh, algorithms we interact with more uh, you know accessible to people well I mean you know we, we on the on there are you know there's Legislation, there's judicial, <laughs> there's administrative, Regulation. and there's there's technology itself. I I think we should free all of these things. You know, I, we I think that it's important that you know the idea that the way Facebook places its advertisements is some kind of national security secret that they can't possibly tell us is rapidly evaporating in the context of a congressional investigation, which I hope they will continue. I don't think that the I think that we have kind of, um, there is a way in which the Silicon Valley does like trade secrets uberalis that is not appropriate anymore. Yeah. I don't think it was appropriate to begin with. I, um, I we, and I also think now that a lot of these companies are setting up ethics committees and that there's a, a discussion about AI and ethics, that these are precisely the issues that could be raised on these committees. And, and all to the good, but don't you think in part that's because the companies are worried about regulators and they're trying to yes. get out in front of the No, well, well, exactly. We get lots of things because yeah. companies are worried about regulators yeah. and want to get out in front of yeah. them. It's, a, it's one of the tools, right? I think that that's a signal that society is not happy with your approach and it may be, you know, I actually think a lot of times if industry sees that and then takes it on itself to try to figure out how to solve it, they'll do a better job than the lawmakers do because <laughs> sometimes they don't understand about math, right? Like, so I think that, 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 that I, I'm not always a fan of legislation um, itself, but I think the threat of legislation does does some does good. Sometimes you actually need a law. Sometimes you might need a judicial decision if you started giving people liability for some of these things. I think in the context of data breaches and security, I'd like to see a lot more liability as a way to get people uh, to get companies to be a little more transparent about what they're doing with things, how things are flowing, and then we should be able to exercise a lot more control over this. I mean. It's a little crazy to me, you know, one of EFF's tools is a thing called Privacy Badger that, um, that lets you block um, third-party cookies. Um, like, w why do we have to build that? I mean, you know, I'm happy to do it. We're a nonprofit. People give us money. We do these kinds of things. But, like, I think there's a problem with this market that 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 nobody that 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 a small nonprofit has to try to build something that gives people back some basic control over their data, as opposed to a bigger company, a venture capital thing, or or something that you know gets available somewhere else. Like, this to me is broken. I mean, I'm happy to do it. We'll keep doing it. We think it's an important tool, but. Like society's broken when a tiny little nonprofit in San Francisco has to be the only people who give you the real ability to say no to tracking online. 
So it, it, it's getting late. Two, two quick last questions, and just an editorial setup for this one. I, I, I personally think that the movie Her, of all the AI movies, is probably the most plausible of the world that we're going to enter. That's my personal statement. So this question, um, can you imagine tech, a technology that people will love more than their smartphone? A robotic pet, a virtual assistant, an AI super friend? What's on the horizon in terms of society? Well, personally, the technology that saves my life and my sister's life is the one that I'm going to love the most, right? I think medical tech is where, um, if, you're, if you're worried, you know, to me, if I'm thinking about what's the thing that's going to make the most important change in my life, it's going to be the thing that helps somebody I love yeah. stick around longer. Uh, Rod Brooks is famous for saying that uh, self-driving cars will be the first elder care robots, mm. for example. I, 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 yeah, I for one will be really happy when the, those other people on the road are actually robots, but, um, <laughs> but Ro that's, that may just be me. Robotic pets, anyone? So I, I wrote a story a, a, couple, a couple of years ago now, a year and a half ago, about uh, a, a Google experiment in, in China called Zhao Ice, which was a texting companion. And 25% of the young user demographic texted, I love you, to it, which I thought was a fairly striking comment. Uh, but, but, so. but in that context, I think it's interesting that the personal, you know, that a lot of the personal assistants are being sort of personalized and um, given personalities, but yet the, isn't it the Google one that they haven't named as a, you know, girl or, you know, that they're very... And, Consciously. Con yes, and, con and I was speaking to somebody about it actually today, and it was a very conscious decision. From Larry Page directly. Uh, was it? Yes. Yes, it was. And, and I think that that's a very progressive move. I yeah. think that's a very good move, and to be very clear with these machines about you know, when the machines are machines and not have, to th have the machines trying to ape human yeah. behavior. Yeah. You know, I have got a real problem with that sort of development, and I think one could have a principle that was... Um, that I got from Toby Walsh, that machines should make it very clear when they're machines, machines. you know. Yeah. So a, a last quick question for a sociologist, perhaps. What is the social meaning of a selfie? What, what, is, the, what is the meaning of a selfie? What's going on oh in God, society? God, I had a student do a dissertation on that. <laughs> <laughs> do we, does anybody know? What, what, selfies didn't happen until there were smartphones, right? Well, that's, well, I haven't got anything in no, intelligent to okay. say about that. Okay. I mean, it's, it's sort of like a, a performance of a presence on Facebook, isn't it? That what students write about when they write about those things is the importance of having, performing a public identity and, and creating a narrative around that and the importance of that for their self, of, for a sense of self. And the selfie is the ultimate sort of reflection of that in a way. So it's a sort of shared, I think what's important about it is that it's a shared self actually. Yeah, that's interesting. Please join me in asking and giving our panel a, a, a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs>